morning, morning, and welcome back to the Wildlands for tonight's episode of our permaculture food forest from day one. And in tonight's episode, we are at week two of our food forest. Yep. In tonight's episode, we're going to plant an orange tree. And I go into the greenhouse and get the staging up and get that all finished. We've got a bit more bark mulch down on our paths and we complete our hoop house project. Plus, at the end, a new segment where we are going to show you how to get lots of plants for free. So enjoy tonight's episode. Exciting project today, got a big roll of rebar here. What are we going to do with that? Go on, Missy, you can do it. Welcome back to the food forest. And I'm stood just on the inside of what I'm calling our hoop house, which is a pretty ingenious design, even though I say so myself. So we've used a spare Vivor polytunnel frame, and then we've covered it in rebar, which comes on a roll. It's just over a meter wide. And currently we've cable tied it on the polytunnel frame. But I think following the advice of Paul, that we're also gonna wire it on twist some wire because he says the cable ties might snap in the heat of the Portuguese summer. So Missy's been busy putting beds in here and she's going to put manure on top and then cardboard them for the no dig method and then this is where we're going to plant all things viney and creepy and beany. Maybe some tomatoes down the middle growing down off wires. Today's day 11 in our permaculture food forest journey. <music> first jobs in the food forest today mentioned in our last episode was to get the orange tree planted in its fancy bed just near the hoop house and in front of our bench where we're currently sat and where bogey's grave is behind us which is somewhere that we love sitting in the summer so you can see yesterday i planted this larger orange tree which is a fairly mature tree might even give us some oranges this year surviving well in the colder weather and i made a border here just around granite stones and this is from the chicken coop floor so it's chicken poo manure and then on top of that i'm going to put potting compost raise it up to here and then round the outside we're going to put wood chip to match the rest of the area but it's going to be fairly narrow and then along the back yet to have some love I'm going to have a slightly raised bed so coming up to about here with the wood chip here and then this back section which is about four foot will be covered in flowers particularly sunflowers and if you remember last year the glorious sunflowers that we had here so we're going to replicate that again this year the idea being is we can sit on the bench here and then we've got the view of the tree and the lovely flowers so i'm going to get on now and get some compost on here and get some wood chip collected and get it down on the floor but first let me show you where we're at with the rest of the fruit forest on day 11. So you can see here swale number two is complete. It's got straw down wood chip on top 
and there's a lot of things you can put on the floor of your swales some people put gravel but personally and most people seem to prefer putting down sawdust wood chip wood bark straw combination of all those including plant waste you could put strimmed grass down anything there to raise it up a bit and that will rot down over time add nutrients so as the water collects in the swale the nutrients will seep through into your plume and help all of your plants on the berms and beyond so as you come through this swale you come round to swale number three and swale number three is naked at the moment so it's had strawberries planted i would think probably about 60 strawberries and that's because strawberries are fairly deep rooting and will help to hold the berm together especially in heavy rain events all the roots there to tie the newly created berm together so that's pretty much all we've done there we've put a gooseberry back in and i think a red currant further down there but yet to put straw and bark down there so if i come back this way and you'll notice these little paths so where my hand is there is a very thin layer of bark but that is the path and here if you remember if i dig down go down about six inches maybe a little bit more below this path so as well as serving as a little narrow path to get through to the next swale and for access to collecting your crops and, and sowing etc this is a flood overflow so the way it works is if you had a big rain event and we do get those here in Portugal and this was to fill up when it gets to the level of the path the water will remain in the swale and begin soaking through but when it then starts to get higher than the swale depth where the path is cut the flood overflow will let the water flow down and then it will come down here and it will either go into what is my tropical bed which has a kind of fault swale and berm here and that's still being prepared or it will flow down here following the bark and go into swale and berm number four and you'll see that swale number four is partially completed so behind me I've got the straw base and then this is one wheelbarrow of bark couple of inches then the straw is underneath so that needs some more bark here and a lot more bark going down and then again, we've planted some more mature strawberries that were moved from elsewhere in the fruit forest version one. And then we've got, again, about 60 or so of these little bare-rooted strawberries. And then again, some more currants, several different types, more at that end as well, and a cherry tree there. So it's all very exciting here down on the wildlands in the fruit forest. Meanwhile, Missy's been very excited about the finishing touches on the hoop house, which we've mentioned quite a few times, and it's very exciting because now Missy is going to show you what she's been up to to finish that project. With the frame now up, it's time to move on to the next jobs. I'm going to keep myself busy making some beds ready to get all my lovely plants in, and Dom has decided that the structure isn't quite stable enough for his liking, haven't you? I have, yeah. Yeah, I can give you a quick demo. And although it is hooped, so it should be strong, obviously the galvanised frame of the Vivo greenhouse is not designed to take such a big weight. So I'm thinking I'm just going to put a big central pole in, just to keep it from collapsing when you've got the weight of lots of very heavy plants, such as the kiwis that are going in. Sounds good. Onwards. <laughs> Put that stuff around the pole? Yeah. yeah. So that's the cementing done and we put it in a plastic pot which you've probably seen us do before and we do that just really to stop the lime from the cement seeping out into the soil where we're going to plant plants really and it also means that at a later date if this part of the land wanted to be reclaimed back to nature this pole and its pot with cement could just be lifted out the ground with a bit of heavy lifting and then it's gone from the environment. I've managed to get three beds in ready to have plants in we've got the pea netting up on the outside of the rebar and I'm going to tell you how I did that. I started on the earth by raising the earth a little bit just using natural soil. I've got a little pond project going on down at the very end of the food forest so I've been taking some of the spare earth from that, wheelbarrowed it up and laid that down to make three narrow 50 centimetre beds. Then I added a layer of homemade compost. Then I added a layer of cardboard which is a weed suppressant.
finally, I finished it off with bagged compost on the top. This is the using the no-dig method. We won't have to dig the beds every spring, so it saves you back, it keeps moisture in the soil, and it's very good at keeping the weeds out. And finally, to finish off, I use more of the bark mulch to mark out the path. It looks nice, it's nice to walk on, and again, it's another weed suppressant and keeps moisture in the soil. house is five meters long and at the first two meters we've planted three kiwis and we'll continue maybe adding kiwis on the other side as well and then on the other three meters you've got your pea netting which is looking great isn't it yes so we're planning to grow a lot of peas mange to and different types of beans this year they need the height so they're going to grow hopefully all the way up over both sides of the arch and then meet in the middle and we're going to succession sow them so that means once a week or once a fortnight I'll put in another row of pea seeds or bean seeds and uh, that way that the first lot start growing up and then the second lot start growing up and as they get bigger and bigger you're going to harvest off of the oldest plants but instead of that harvest finishing you're going to have the newer plants and the newer plants and the newer plants so you've got hopefully a constant harvest all the way through the summer and we've also thought that it'd be really handy if it does get too hot like it did last year and the plants are suffering a little bit we can just drape shade netting over the whole, over the tops of the plants, over the whole hoop, hoop house, and hopefully that'll uh, keep the keep the vegetables growing on the inside. Do we know how well peas and beans, etc., grow in Portugal from our experience last year? Yeah, we tried growing some last year. Uh, I had them in a bit of a shady spot, so then they didn't grow very well in the spring. They weren't getting enough sun, and then as soon as the sun was strong enough to reach them, it crisped their leaves, and I couldn't keep them moist enough, I couldn't keep them watered, uh, but that's more my failings about where I'd put them as well as the uh, the harsh sun, so that's why I've given them such good beds, there's lots of moisture retention in there and hopefully they'll be able to keep growing even if it gets hot. It's exciting isn't it? Yeah. So now I'm heading back to the greenhouse to show you what I've done this week to finish the greenhouse off, it's very exciting, and we've also decided that instead of putting a window or door at the other end that I mentioned in the first two episodes of the Vivor greenhouse build, that we're going to experiment with a hothouse, aren't we? Yes, yeah, I think it's a really good idea, keeping lots of moisture in there. Yeah, so we don't know how that's going to go, so we've started off, we've got three tubs of water in there, it's already getting very humid, even though we're not even at spring yet, so let me show you where I'm at on our finished polytunnel. Now we're in the polytunnel. I thought I'd show you my bananas. So I've got six babies here, two of each type, which is a Chinese banana, which is probably frost hardy, loses its leaves in the winter, forms quite a big bush-like banana structure and has a very nice flower. And it comes from part of China that's quite cold. So may even put it outside and leave it outside next winter see what happens with some straw on. I've got two Musa baz Bazjos, which are ornamental bananas, not really growing much in the way of edible fruit, but they again are hardy. A lot of people have them in England, and again, they grow quite large, maybe two meters over the course of the summer, and they throw out lots of suckers, and then when the winter comes, if you don't wrap them in fleece and straw, they die back to the ground, and then in the spring, they come back after the frosts. If you protect the trunk though, again by wrapping them like this which you can do in the garden with quite big, big bananas uh, then you can get a much bigger Musa badge joke because each year the trunk is not damaged by the frost and then the new growth comes out top and then I have another banana which I cannot remember the name of because it's wrapped in fleece so I'll show you that when I unwrap them in a month or so here I've got a Fatsia japonica which is a hardy shrub and it is an architectural plant with these lovely leaves that are often a lot shinier when they're new out and that is in the greenhouse because I bought it in a uh, nursery where it had been kept inside so I'm just hardening it off it's quite hot in here at the moment but at night it's very cold we had minus 3.6 a couple of days ago so as you can see that survived that fine and then here at the back I've got a very large canarian banana and I'm really protecting the trunk here up to here is where the trunk is and you can see the leaves at the top which have already died and yellowed from from the frost but my main objective is to protect the trunk so again come back in a month I'll show you how she's doing so my next job here in the greenhouse is I'm going to put a good two to three inch layer of wood chip on the floor a because it looks nice but also to act as a bit of an insulator the floor obviously gets a lot of the cold coming from the other side where it's outside of the greenhouse and also 
I'm going to put in a five meter by one meter set of staging and in the middle of that I'm looking at heating the greenhouse from compost which I've never done before. I've been watching lots of YouTubes and I'm getting a lot of mixed information about how that works, whether it works and what temperature you can attain. So I follow Charles Dowding and he heats his greenhouse with horse manure. I can't do that here because although I can get horse manure for it to retain its heat hot enough to combat frost you need to replace or top it up every two weeks with fresh horse manure and obviously i don't have a horse don't have anyone near to me that has a horse that i could just get a few buckets worth of fresh manure to keep it going so what that would mean is after two weeks the horse manure would slow down its rotting process and not maintain its heat not be hot enough to heat a greenhouse through a frost so my second plan is to heat it using a more traditional composting system now I'm getting a lot of mixed information on the temperatures that can be attained and how that can be done and how often you have to add things and or the mix and or how often you have to turn the compost. So what I'm planning to do is I'm going to use grass and or chicken manure which counts as a green due to its high level of nitrogen and then I'm going to use recycled kitchen tissue that we've been collecting and that we continue to collect and I'm going to mix that tissue with uh, small twigs and other bits and pieces that I get while I'm gardening and the theory is if I turn that daily I should be able to maintain enough of a temperature from the compost to maintain the polytunnel above freezing and some plants even need above five or ten degrees so that would be even more exciting so I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. I'm also trying another low-tech system. I'm trying to get some barrels, which I'm going to put in the hottest part of the greenhouse, where it's most exposed to the sun, with a view that on a day like today, where it's quite cold out, but in the greenhouse, it's probably now about 25 degrees. I'm actually getting quite warm. The barrels will heat up the water inside them from the sun and the temperature in here. And then at night, they will release that heat slowly into the atmosphere of the polytunnel and again help to keep it warmer and above freezing so I'm going to try both of those and see what I can do to the temperature that actually have that long before the frost start maybe a month at the most and I've yet to start building anything and I want to also carry on with the food forest I've got a lot to do so keep following to see whether I can heat my greenhouse from compost and or water in barrels exciting stuff <music> standing there in the hall right so I've pre-cut my wood and this is just the basic frame of the staging for the greenhouse it's going to be five meters long two two and a half meter sections which will be separate so we can always have them on opposite sides if we wish to move them so I'm going to drill all my pilot holes start screwing it together get the basic two frames up and then we'll see where we're at So I've got the two top frames made. So these are the feet. nearly finished so I've got to finish the edging here which is just off screen and around the back so it's the same as this edging here there's a big hole here that's where I'm going to make the potting table and then at this end way down there you can see we had a spare piece of polystyrene from the cold frame might as well use that as free insulation we're going to put capillary matting over the top capillary matting here and then ready to go job done
going to show you how to propagate figs, which is something that I didn't know and I learned from Gary, who has given us many fig cuttings, which you can see here behind me. So you simply cut off an 18 inch stick off one of your fig trees. You can do this throughout the dormant season and any little branches here, I'm just going to trim those off. And then you simply take a gardener's knife and you take off a couple of inches of the bark from the bottom and those couple of inches want to be a nodule away there and then you simply take said end and put it into sand like these ones here and they take about a year so it's a long wait but you can see you've got lots of nice healthy roots and then you can pop them on and then once they get going they are quite fast growing so free plants and in this case free figs for years to come so another week week two in food forest version two and yep. it's looking great isn't i think it? we're doing so well two weeks in and we've got the beautiful beds the whole hoop house project is done it's ready for the plants to go in so that's really really exciting going to be next <laughs> you don't know uh, next projects are we're going to keep working our way down to the bottom of the food forest and we're going to um, enrich some of the beds we're going to bring down more compost that we've made and more earth from inside the chicken enclosure and build up where the beds are going to go and then they will also be cardboarded and have bag compost on the top ready for That's the right. plants so Missy mentioned at the beginning of the episode about no dig, so we've got to spread that. We're going to redo the whole of the food forest, aren't we? Yep. So that the whole food forest has got new cardboard to suppress the weeds and be ready for all the seedlings that are going to go in very soon. Yes, yes. Oh, and I'm going to take you into the cold frame next week and show you what seedlings I already have coming up, even though it's only the middle of February. And uh, I think I think we should probably sow some more, shouldn't we? We should get yeah. more seeds in Let's the earth. Let's get sowing. I'd also like to thank those of you that have supported us on Buy Me a Coffee, especially those of you that have gone to the wish list and bought us some trees, which are planted in the food forest now. So that's very exciting. And at a later date, we will be naming those trees in a kind of thank you remembrance for the wonderful support that you've given us. So if you'd like to support the food forest. I'll put a link in our description. You can head over to buy me a coffee. But thanks very much to everyone who supports us and for your comments and likes. It's very much appreciated. I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Bye.